Namaste. So I hope you've enjoyed watching the video of the complete Shivalinga Puja. I wanted to make some comments on it because we should never take anything at face value. We should always inquire and find out if it's really the version given in the Vedas. You see, my position is that the Vedas are absolute. In other words, the statements given in the Vedas, beginning with their statements about their own origin, are to be taken as literally true. And what do they say? The Vedas say they come from the breathing of Mahavishnu. Mahavishnu is basically the first being created in the universe by Shiva and Shakti. In the beginning of the universe, he lies down in the causal ocean on the snake Shesha, Sheshanaga. And he goes into mystic slumber. And from his navel, Lord Brahma is born. And Brahma and Vishnu create the various creatures and worlds and everything that we see now in the manifested universe, including the scriptures. So Brahma, from the breathing of Mahavishnu, then collated several scriptures, actually many scriptures, extremely voluminous and complete, and passed them down to his sons and disciples. And those have been coming down by tradition ever since. That's the Vedas. Yes, at a certain point, they were written down in human language by human beings. But way before that, they were oral traditions passed down by beings with eidetic memories. In other words, they could remember everything they had ever heard without any inaccuracies. Now, we don't often come across people today with those kind of abilities. Human beings in Kali Yuga are notoriously, how can I say, feeble-minded due to our excessive indulgence in sex life. Every time you have an orgasm, there goes some of your intelligence. And so, the Vedas teach celibacy as not only a way to preserve one's energy and good health, even into advanced old age, but also to make the mind like a pure and complete repository of everything that you've ever learned. So, because people don't take the statements in the Vedas at face value, but they bring in their own interpretations, their own additions, their own ideas. Therefore, the Vedic knowledge has become distorted. And a good example is this Shivalinga Puja. Although what's being done is sort of generally in line with the Shiva Shastras and the Tantras. It does not follow them in its particulars, and especially in its mood. If we go into the Shastras, the Vedic scriptures, and we look at the instructions for the Puja, everything is given there in detail. All the mantras, the type of offerings, the way it's supposed to be done, and so on. And basically, what we see in this puja really doesn't follow those instructions at all. It's a made-up tradition. And it's also, the mood is very passionate. 
And I'm going to go into the reasons why this is so. Now, of course, I tried to discuss this with the Pujari, Shubham, Shubham Tiwari. And basically, no discussion is possible. His position is, well, I'm doing what I was taught by my guru, and that's it. I'm, it's not open to discussion. It's, it's not open to Shastric references. It's not open to any kind of argument or logic or anything. It's just what I got from my teacher, and that's it, period. Now, in some ways, this is commendable. Uh, this is how the Vedic tradition, or any tradition, is passed down from one generation to another, from one teacher or guru to a student or disciple. And that, so that's the good side. But the bad side is, what if the guru is wrong? What if the guru has projected his own ideas onto the rites and rituals? What if they're not really following the scriptures, but doing something different instead? So to understand this, we have to pull back and analyze the whole situation. This temple is in a holy place that's f frequented by many devotees. Nowadays, they become like tourists. They're wearing Western clothes. They're not wearing any religious symbols or spiritual clothing. Uh, the, they're wearing jeans, even the women show up at the temple wearing jeans and with their hair down, which is completely non-Vedic, completely anti-Vedic, actually. A sannyasi like myself finds it disturbing. They're putting their bodies on display like that. In Vedic culture, only the husband is supposed to see a woman with her hair down or dressed, uh, how can I say, immodestly. They should be wearing saris, they should have their heads covered, and so on like that. But this temple allows anybody and everybody to come in and even to participate in the puja, no matter if they're dressed inappropriately or, or not. So, because there is a competition between the temples, the uh, environment puts pressure on each temple to become the most showy, the most attractive, the most interesting, and somehow get the attention of the people who are coming to visit. And since these people are passionate and ignorant, they're not in the mode of goodness at all. The temples have become increasingly showy and theatrical and passionate in order to grab their attention. And so we see that this puja doesn't follow strictly the guidelines in the scriptures. It's very showy, it's very theatrical. It's also very loud. Uh, they use a, a big bell, for example, that's like ear-splitting, you know, it's so loud. Why? There's no need for it. And what does Shastra say? Well, I've been studying Shiva Purana lately. Shiva Purana says, actually in three or four places that I've seen so far, the worship of Shiva should be in sattvic mood. Sattva is the mode of goodness. And the mode of goodness means it should be gentle, quiet, it should be pure, and very specifically, the instructions in the scriptures should be followed. There should be yantras, there should be certain mantras. Now, this Pujari knows a lot of mantras, but he recites them very passionately, very quickly. And so there's no chance to even hear what they are, what to speak of, learn them. So he's guarding the teaching that he was given by his master. 
And he's using it to make a show that attracts tourists in the hope that they'll give donations to the temple and support everybody. So as a result, the whole thing gradually spirals downward in quality. And we see this not only in this particular temple, but in all the temples and traditions I've been able to find anywhere, even in India. I've made uh, a lot of comments earlier when I was in Tiruvannamalai about the degradation of Ramana Maharshi's teaching in only two generations of disciples, how it's become almost the complete opposite of the original. And so we can see, even in a very short time, 50 or 60 years, that a teaching can become almost opposite to its original intent. And so what to speak of in 500 years or 1,000 years or 10,000 years. So this is the way of the world. Everything has a birth, a youth, middle age, old age, and death. And then it has to be reconstituted and reborn. This is the way of the world. This is how it works. So it's not surprising to see that these traditions are in a state of degeneration. But what is surprising, at least to me, is that nobody seems to have a problem with it. <laughs> that it's all okay. And I can't find anybody who is doing the puja or doing their sadhana strictly according to the Shastra. I wish I could. I wish I could uh, get association with sannyasis similar to myself who are following the directions in the scripture. Like right now it's uh, 3.45 a.m. And I usually get up at 3 or 3.30. Today I got up at 1.30. Because I like the silent morning hours. It's the best for meditation, for chanting, for contemplation, for study, for everything. <laughs> so this is going on all over the world. That, well, for example, look at what happened to yoga and tantra when they started being taught in the West. They got completely corrupted, completely perverted, completely overlaid with a superimposition of Western ideas. For example, teaching yoga for money. Nobody in India taught yoga for money until yoga teachers started going to the West. So this is only like 50 or 60 years old this practice of charging money for yoga. It's completely new. It's completely original. Where did it come from? Western mercantilism, of course. A yoga teacher should be a Brahmin, not a Vaisha. He should be a scholar, not a businessman. And he should adhere very closely to the original scriptures. For example, in Tantra, Everybody knows or should know that practicing Tantra means avoiding orgasm, especially for the male. But almost nobody practices this, and even the ones that do and the ones that teach it don't know the original terminology, the original name of this practice, Vajroli Mudra. You ask any Tantra teacher, what's the name of this practice? They can't tell you. Because they don't study the scriptures. They simply get whatever they can from various books and teachers and then hang out a shingle and make a business of it. That's not the real thing. That's not what we're doing. And you should not accept 
when other people do it. You should uh, tell them, give them feedback, and let them know that what they're doing is not according to the scriptures. And you should withdraw any support from them and find your own way with using the scriptures as the light. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya.